you guys. Well, that was a great introduction, and you will get to hear about some of those natural systems in urban areas, so I hope you're excited <laughs> for that. Um, but yes, I'm going to be talking to you about um, ecosystem goods and services, and more specifically giving you kind of my perspective, which is coming as an, an engineer, um, or an ecological engineer maybe, so maybe some a little bit of a different type of approach to engineering perhaps sometimes, but looking at how we can better integrate nature services in the way we design or manage um, ecosystems, be they in a natural setting or in more of a um, constructed or designed setting. So I want to start our time out by giving you a picture of what I hope that you'll walk out of here thinking about. And so some of those points are um, a better understanding of what ecosystem services are, and with that, the immense value that they um, contribute to our, um, to our to human health and well-being. Um, secondly, having a, a clear understanding of um, how that human health and well-being is directly connected to ecosystem services and that even though we have technology available, um, that it doesn't provide a perfect substitution. So there are limits. And so that's why we need to have functioning ecosystems to provide us with these beneficial services. And then based on points one and two, I hope that if you're in a position um, later in life, maybe in your career or, or, or who knows, but if you have the opportunity to work on some of these challenges um, that incorporate ecosystem management or, or some sort of engineering design that you would um, try or want to have a desire to approach those types of problems um, with an ecosystem services perspective. And so I'm going to talk about some of the um, um, issues that are involved with that. So thinking about how we can um, look at a, a suite of objectives as opposed to just one, or looking at how we want to consider a whole life cycle of impacts as opposed to um, just what we, what we start with on day one. So in getting toward those take-home points, we're, I'm going to be going through um, what ecosystem services are, um, where, where they are and what their status is um, globally, give a few examples of how um, ecosystem services provide benefits to us, and then talk about, um, again, kind of bringing in some of my experience and perspectives, how we can better manage and design for ecosystem services within some of our more constructed um, environments. So ecosystem services, are any of you familiar with this term? I guess before I launch into it, have you heard? So I, I see some heads nodding. Um, so, so ecosystem services, more and more people are talking about it, because as we're going to see, there's been some really um, significant um, studies related to ecosystem services. Um, but these refer to the benefits that people obtain from ecosystems. And these are the benefits that are contributing directly to human health and well-being. And in general, um, these services have been divided in, or categorized into a kind of four different categories. So we have those services that are um, called provisioning services. So these, this refers to um, or acknowledges the fact that the food we eat, the water we drink or otherwise use, um, the raw materials that go as inputs to other processes, um, genetic and medicinal resources, say, that are used in pharmaceuticals or, or any of these other um, outcomes that we seek are provided by ecosystems. We also have regulating services. So this would include regulating um, floods or other disturbances. It could be um, disease. It could be um, some other climatic extreme that where ecosystems are providing essentially a buffer to us. Um, this also includes regulating air and water quality, so the quality of the, the water we drink or use and the air we breathe. Um, as well as the climate, and this could be at a global scale, so regulating greenhouse gas balances in the atmosphere, or it could be at a, at a micro scale, so um, kind of the microclimatic effects that, say, trees provide and energy building savings caused by vegetation and, and some of those types of benefits. We also have cultural services. Um, these are kind of the um, people enjoying ecosystems, so maybe a little bit harder to quantify, but could include um, the ability to recreate in ecosystems, the ability to have educational experiences or just an, an aesthetic appeal that they might provide. And then finally, a category called supporting services. So this includes things that are happening that maybe we don't directly think about or think of as benefits, but the fact that in ecosystems you have soils being formed and you have nutrients being cycled and you have photosynthesis driving primary productivity. 
So these are um, the types of services we're talking about when we think about ecosystem services. To see this in a, a graphical way, and this is taken directly from the Millennium, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which we'll talk about a little bit later. It's a report that was released not too long ago. You can see how each of these categories of ecosystem services, so our provisioning, regulating, cultural, are directly con um, contributing to all of these different, um, what they're calling constituents of well-being. So whether that's um, human security or providing basic material for, um, for living, um, health or other social relations, you can see how these interactions have been um, linked, at least by um, one group of people who have thought quite a bit about this. Um, you can also see that, again, these supporting services, even though they don't have a, a direct link to our health and well-being, they are essential to provide those other services that we rely upon. And then underlying all of this is biodiversity. So without diversity from the microbial up through you know, the, um, the top predators, we don't have these services, or at least as, as we might expect them to be or want them to be. So I like to give this little example. Um, have any of you, I hope you have, have you read The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein? All right. It's an older book. It was published in the 70s, I think. But it's, I think it's still a classic. Um, but if you're not familiar with the story, basically there's this tree, OK? And this tree and this is friends with this boy. And so it's talking about the friendship between this boy and this tree. And, and the boy just enjoys what he, what he does. He swings and climbs in the tree's branches. He, eats the apples, he uh, eventually cuts down the tree, which is sad, but all for a purpose. And so what this tree was giving him, in addition to the, the friendship of the story, was um, all of these ecosystem services, right? So he gets to eat the apples. He gets to even sell the apples for his own livelihood because he needed money. Um, he gets timber. He makes a canoe to, um, to travel, to see the, see the world. Um, I don't know if it talked about microclimate in the story, but he probably enjoyed the cooling effects of being in the shade and um, that sort of service. Um, culturally, he was recreating. He, um, when he did cut down the tree, he just went back and sat on it because it, was a, it provided a good experience for him to contemplate in. So these are some of the services that just this one tree was providing to a boy in a, in a story. Um, and again, even though the story was not about these supporting services, all of this stuff would have been going on in a real, a real life situation, right? Um, I'm not suggesting that we rewrite the giving tree to include supporting services, but just understanding how the supporting services are providing all of this to this boy. So this is just a single tree and um, an example from a children's story. But if we think about the value of ecosystem services on a global scale, we can. So we go from a single tree to thinking about the whole world. And this is one of the studies that has really spurred a lot of interest in ecosystem <laughs> services, that people are actually trying to attach a monetary value, not so much to say we need to be trading these on a market, but to help people better understand the value of a service we don't pay for otherwise. And so this group led by um, Robert Costanza back in 1997 released a report that they used all these different economic um, techniques to try and come up with a value for the world's ecosystem services. And the value they arrived at was $46 trillion, which I have trouble even understanding how much money that is. Um, but they kind of repeated the study in 2000, or in a paper released in 2014, which maybe some of you have read in here, and um, came up with a revised figure that's two and a half times larger, right? So, so the story here is that on a global scale, the benefits that um, ecosystems are providing to us as, as a society are, are tremendous. This is larger than our gross domestic product of the world. And so, um, but we don't, always, we don't always value that. We don't always understand that in the way that we make decisions. But just to kind of give you a few more concrete examples of how ecosystem services translate to a value, I just um, wanted to show you, well, first, kind of how those values are distributed among the different types of biomes. So you can see wetlands are a real power player in terms of the value that they provide to us and in, in the services that they provide. Um, you can see we have, we have a lot of grassland here in the Great Plains that has some good, um, providing some value to us as well. 
And just to give some more um, examples of some of these different services, this is um, the case of the New York City's water supply. And it's really kind of the poster child for ecosystem services and understanding the value that ecosystems um, provide to us. So in this case, the city of New York actually draws its water supply from this um, watershed, the, um, the Catskill Delaware watershed, which is just north of the, the city. And in general, they, um, so they're using this watershed to, to provide their 9 million residents um, with drinking water daily. And the city was faced with a decision because their water quality from this watershed was declining. So one option is to come in with an engineered system, which we very much know how to design, to provide additional filtration to make that water drinkable for their citizens. And so they could do that for six to eight billion dollars, plus you know, a handful of money each year, to um, operate and manage the system. But rather than doing that, they decided um, to protect the ecosystem, which I don't, I guess I didn't put, oh, they did, the number up here. So it cost them rather instead to preserve the services that this, um, Watershed was providing $150 million a year to basically buy lands, um, fix failing septic systems, do these things that would allow the ecosystem to continue to provide that water quality and quantity regulating types of services. And so in this case, you can see that, um, that the services that this watershed is providing to the city just in terms of their drinking water are huge. Plus, this doesn't you know, this comparison wouldn't account for recreation opportunities, um, carbon sequestration going on in this area, the biodiversity benefits, and so there's um, a whole package that's not even being considered when you just look at these um, two numbers here. Another example, we mentioned that um, wetlands have a huge value. Well, there are some cases, and this was the Corps of Engineers, and they really like to build structures, but even they saw that, <laughs> <laughs> that it was, a much better deal to just let the natural wetlands continue to provide that function of flood protection rather than coming in and building more ex expensive um, flood control structures like levees or, or flood walls. Um, and so by basically purchasing these, this series of wetlands, $8.3 million, they project that they're saving about $17 million per year in um, avoided damages due to flooding. So this could be um, to cropland, to homes, I guess it's in Boston, so a um, so huge benefit there. Plus again, all of those other benefits, right? That we don't get from a levy. A little bit closer to home, this is looking at um, the Great Plains ecoregion, so Kansas is square in the middle of that. And this was a study done by um, Dr. Dodds here at Kansas State. And what his group did is they compared the values provided by native versus restored grassland, which are, for the most part, um, pretty similar. But you can see that one of the great things about having all of the grassland that we have around here, be it restored or native, is that it has a huge contribution to our ag commodities, particularly um, raising beef, right? That's our state really relies upon that, um, as well as recreation. Um, Kansas Wildlife and Parks has paired up with the Department of Tourism because the hunting recreation that our state provides is a big part of the um, tourism that pours into our economy here in Kansas. So again, this is just to kind of give some examples of how ecosystem services provide us direct benefit and how we can think about those in terms of money to kind of help us better understand those benefits. And you would think that maybe with as valuable as these um, ecosystem services are that we would we would work to keep them. And in some cases we do, but, but in general, we tend to develop the landscape for our purposes that often only have one benefit. Um, and so in this case, you might see, you know, we have a lot of um, residential development that um, will come into natural areas and, and agricultural areas. So we're losing some of those services for, for food production and habitat and some of those other um, important benefits. And so that same study by Robert Costanza's group looked at this loss of um, ecosystems due to land use conversion. And they came up with um, that the loss was, could be valued at somewhere between four and $20 trillion. So that's, again, some very big numbers. Um, just to highlight how important, um, one, the ecosystem services are, but two, that as we have opportunities to um, to have input to how these 
systems or designs, whether it's an urban area or an agro ecosystem, that we can um, try to better optimize through the design how ecosystem services would be provided. So some of these changes um, in ecosystem services have been highlighted in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report. So if you have more interest in the kind of the global state of things, this is a great reference. But basically this report went through, and so just as um, Costanza's paper said, we have a loss and it can be valued, they looked at all of these different services and rated them as they're either in decline or improving. And so you can see that over the last few decades, we've been improving um, our food production ability with the way that we've managed the landscape with different cropping and livestock um, operations. But perhaps as part of some of these management decisions, in addition to other land use change, you can see a lot of these other provisioning services are in decline because we're not optimizing for a suite of services typically. We're looking at one, say, looking just to, to maximize crop yield perhaps. Um, in, other, in terms of regulating services, a lot of them you can see are also in decline on a global scale, and, and you can find plenty of local examples as well. And then as a result, they've also um, shown that plenty of the, the cultural services are also in a, a decline or maybe an area where we don't really know. This is a figure to kind of reflect this decline from um, a water resources perspective. So the top, the top figure here shows um, areas of the world that are um, where the water security is threatened. And you can think of the water security being directly linked to um, a degradation of the ecosystems and the ecosystem services that those um, ecosystems would provide in terms of regulating the quantity and or the quality of water that um, people living in these regions are dependent upon. And so red is kind of in the uh, danger zone, I guess, in terms of um, water security. <coughs> But I think it's important to note that even though we have this potential for very high water insecurity, including in kind of where we are here in, the, um, in Kansas, that we can adapt to some of this through implementation of different um, technological means, okay? So here we can, um, for instance, we don't have a lot of water that falls on the ground out in western Kansas, but we can irrigate, right? We can still use the groundwater stores that are in those areas to increase the water security. Um, where the water quality is poor, we can have um, different drinking water or other treatment plants to remove those pollutants. Um, and so this is where, so in developed parts of the world, we've been able to kind of get around some of the loss or degradation or ecosystem services. Um, but in other parts of the world, that's, that hasn't been the case because it's typically very expensive to try to replace um, ecosystem services with a more technological means. But the picture that I don't want to leave you with is that this is not what's happening, okay? It's not like you choose either technology or ecosystem <laughs> services and, and one of them will win. Um, in fact, I really liked this quote from um, the paper that um, some of you read for this class, Costanza's um, Ecosystem Services Valuation Paper. And that's that um, rather than vying technological advances or, or human ingenuity, if you will, against um, ecosystems and the services that they provide us, that rather in looking at these things, we've um, decided that um, the ecosystem services and the study of those um, identify the limitations and the costs of hard engineering solutions. So we saw some of those in the previous ex examples, right? Um, and that, in fact, when we start measuring and trying to quantify and better understand ecosystem services and then integrate them into how we manage a landscape, that that's a good example of, uh, of human ingenuity. And so, so rather than having two systems at war with each other, rather we have ecosystem services, which is all within kind of what we do here in our, um, our social sphere, our techno sphere, um, and that ecosystem services are part of that. And this is very conceptual, but you can see that there's ideally some interaction among all of these pieces of, of the natural world and then the built environments in which we live that contribute to our well-being. Okay. And so what I'm trying to show here is really just the importance of of ecosystem services in, in that they're not replaceable per se, but that perhaps um, they're not exclusive or mutually excluded by um, some of our more technological adaptations. <laughs>
And so this point brings me to what I really wanted to talk to you about. And that was um, looking at how we can perhaps better design and manage landscapes to preserve or even enhance ecosystem service provision. Okay? And again, I'm an, an engineer, so I think about this question in terms of um, really on the design side. But uh, some of you may have interest in um, natural resource management or, um, or <coughs> other aspects of engineering that this can um, just as likely be applied to. And so in thinking about how we can do this, so how we can enhance ecosystem service provision by some of these systems, um, I think it's key to think about we're not just designing for a single service or a single benefit anymore, but we're thinking about a suite of services because that's what an ecosystem does and that's what we could strive for in our engineered or constructed systems. It's also important, I think, to understand the trade-offs. And we haven't quite figured this out, like how in a constructed or, or an engineered setting how these different services might interact or how, you know, if we are maximizing one, how we might actually produce um, some disservice. But, um, but this is an area that we need to be um, conscious of, that there are trade-offs in design. And then finally, also thinking, taking a life cycle perspective with these systems. So there are different environmental accounting um, methods that you can use to look at not just an upfront cost in terms of um, dollars, right? But in terms of the other types of environmental benefits or, or um, um, environmental costs that you could be incurring through a different type of system. And so I want to give you an example, and this is coming from kind of a water resources management perspective, but you could also apply it to managing an agroecosystem or, or some other um, type of managed system. But basically, um, I've worked a lot in, in urban areas and in looking at how we manage the runoff coming from these areas. And in a lot of places, an easy way to manage that runoff is to put it in a pipe and then put it in a pond and then, it, and then maybe it goes someplace else after that. An alternative, and not that ponds are all bad, but an alternative to a pond is a stormwater wetland. And so the main difference you can probably see very clearly between these two systems is that you have, whereas you have a lot of open water here and kind of homogeneity in terms of the habitat, you've got all sorts of um, plants here. What's happening is you have different subs or water depths, so you have different zones for habitat, so you're trying to create more biodiversity. Um, but in the end, the goal of the system, the goal of both systems in an urban setting is to try to keep, well, you hope people's property from flooding, and then also to provide some um, control downstream, so to not degrade aquatic ecosystems downstream. So in some of the work I've done is we've looked at some of the other benefits that these, um, these two systems are, are providing. So just in your head, you can kind of think this system was designed with really kind of a um, more of a singular focus in, in just holding the water as cheaply as possible and then releasing it at a slower rate downstream. Um, and maybe, I don't know about this pond, but some, sometimes people enjoy living by ponds because you can fish and things, but I don't know that that, that would be the case for this little pond. Um, and then this system over here, the wetland system, is also designed with the same intent, but maybe is providing a broader suite of services. And so some of the things we looked at, well, you can look at water quality, because that's another benefit that a natural ecosystem would provide. And so you, these, this, these numbers are based on a bunch of studies, and you can see they're pretty, they're actually pretty common, or similar. Um, there is some difference in the nitrogen, and that's because in a wetland, you tend to have more um, cycling of nutrients. You tend to create better um, habitat, if you will, for the microbes that are responsible for um, cycling nitrogen and, and removing it from the water and putting it back into the atmosphere. And so that's part of that number. So maybe we can say wetlands are better at um, optimizing kind of a broader um, suite of services from a water quality standpoint can also look at um, the effects of, of these two different systems on the insects that you might find in them. So what we did is we did a bunch of um, insect surveys in, in, a, in ponds and wetlands. And what we tended to find, even though we found 
a lot of critters in both of them, we found this is a mosquito larvae. And so this is one thing to think about when you're designing a system such as a wetland or a pond or any place you have open water, you're going to be creating habitat for maybe some, some pests that people don't like and that aren't beneficial for human health. But if you think about the habitat service that a natural ecosystem would provide, you can try to provide different niches for these, um, habit or for these pest predators. So what we found in the wetland system is that we were actually creating an environment in which we had some natural pest control going on. So even though we had some mosquito larvae, they were largely being eaten by, um, say, dragonfly nymphs, or um, this is a, a back swimmer, or even some fish. And so we had all these different habitats for, for different types of insects, so we had fewer mosquitoes in the wetlands versus the ponds. And so that's a beneficial service that just by kind of taking a more natural design, thinking about a wetlands, can provide. We looked at carbon sequestration, right? That's another service that ecosystems provide when you're thinking about the global, um, global climate and, um, and greenhouse gas regulation. And even though we're just talking about a, a pretty small area, you know, if this can, it's still a part of the equation. And what we found was that wetlands were sequestering way more carbon than the ponds were. And the reason they were doing that, we suspect, and it would make sense, is that there's, there's vegetation in these systems. Whereas a pond is just mostly open water, a wetland you have vegetation. You know, you've designed for shallow water conditions so you can support vegetation. That vegetation is photosynthesizing, pulling in carbon from the, the atmosphere. It's depositing it in the soil, in the sediments, and it's accumulating there because you have good conditions to, um, to hold that, so that carbon in the soil. And so this is, a, I think, a, a really nice benefit that you can get, have a wetland um, provide to you, whereas a pond may not do so well in that aspect. And finally, we tried to look at cultural services, too. And what we found, essentially, is that both ponds and wetlands or any engineered or designed system, I think, has the potential to provide these types of services. But as it was, the wetlands tended to have much more, um, there was much more evidence that these systems were being used for recreation or education. And I think part of it is that maybe people just find them more interesting, right? There's, there's some different plants. There's, we found all sorts of interesting insects and fish and frogs living in these systems because of the habitat that you've created. Um, so we decided that from an ecosystem services perspective, and in thinking about how we might design a system, again, with that goal being managing your stormwater, that you can optimize not just the stormwater management aspects, but this whole suite of other services. So trying to think about designing systems for a suite of services and not just one. But an alternative, and this is interesting, is even thinking about, well, we looked at some of these ponds that have actually some wetland aspects to them and found they actually provided some of those same services. So here we can um, use what we learned from one ecosystem versus another or one design system versus another and integrate them to um, get more benefit out of it. So that's on kind of an individual practice scale. Now let's think about more of um, zooming out to getting to a landscape scale and thinking about how we, um, again, I'm going to look, talk about kind of the urban hydrology perspective, um, but thinking about building in ecosystems and ecosystem services as part of these systems that we designed. So in terms of stormwater, there's, there's a couple of routes to take. These two cases are kind of at either end of the extreme. So in this case, we've decided that the most important thing is to, to get the water away from people, okay? And to do that, we're going to fill in the depressional areas. Maybe we'll build houses on them, because then we can, we can build more houses that way. So fill in maybe what may have been a wetland or an area that would hold water, but instead we'll put it in our system of pipes. And we'll make the pipes big enough that we can move all the water down to, in this case, there's a lake below this little development. And so I don't, I, this isn't really an example of ecosystem services, because we've pretty much um, kind of removed from what was, well now it's an urban ecosystem because we're still talking about ecosystems, but we've taken away a lot of the functionality um, of that system. 
Over here, they still have, and you can kind of see the outlines in the purple, they still have water that's being moved into pipes. But they've made decisions in this community that they're not going to fill in wetlands and they're not going to let people who might want to live, well, right on this lake, but they're going to, the city is going to purchase some of the, the wetland buffers around some of these different water areas to preserve um, ecosystem services, really, or the ability of that um, ecosystem to continue providing some of those benefits. And so just as um, an example, of what um, this could look like from in terms of the hydraulic regulating services, so in terms of the ability to um, move and store water. This is our, our system where we have a lot of pipes. And basically, what the colors mean, if you see red, that means that there's, there's flooding that could be damaging buildings or otherwise damaging property. But for the most part, this is not too bad, right? This system looks OK. This system. Over here, where we've got more of kind of the ecosystem integrated with, within our kind of our built um, infrastructure, is also looking okay. The green just indicates where we've got some of their, their engineered ponds that are filling up, but they're still, they're not flooding. And this is an example for the design storm. So this is the case, these pipes were designed to hold a storm of this size, which happens to be about four inches in this case, all right? But what we see um, is that how do we account how do we account for changes, right? So in, in terms of hydrology, how do we account for a changing climate? These pipes are, are kind of fixed in diameter. So when we start thinking about what this design storm might look like in about 50 years, based on some different climate projections, we now see we've got a lot of flooding, right? All the red, that's flooding, so that's not good. Over here, we've got, again, you see more colors showing up. These are areas where the water is going. So it's not fitting into necessarily their pipe anymore, but it's spreading out. Oh, it's spreading in some of these preserved wetland areas, in some of these, um, well, they're recreational areas, but they're, there's no homes. It's OK for those to flood. And that's for kind of a moderate projection. If we start thinking about, so these projections are based on where our um, greenhouse gas concentrations might be going. So this would be a more pessimistic scenario. So thinking about kind of a, um, on the upper end of what we might expect the um, design storm for this community to look like, which is 150% or 1.5 times greater than their current design. You can see now we've got a lot of flooding going on here. And again, same story. We've got some flooding, but for the, but for the complete part, it's held within those areas that were set, set aside, not to be built upon, but to serve some other um, purpose, be it for recreation or um, for flood storage and other, um, and other benefits related to the hydrology of the system. And so the point to make here is that our hard infrastructure is relatively, it's inflexible. And so if we can think about ways to better integrate um, functioning ecosystems within our design system. So not to say that we can't have pipes or not to say that we can't have some other hard infrastructure, but that when we um, are able to preserve some of these um, ecosystems and the services that they provide, we can perhaps avoid some of the um, damages that we, we didn't design for. In this case, we didn't design our systems for a changing climate. And that's exactly the point that this um, paper is making here is that as we move into the future, it's going to be more and more important um, for communities, um, well here, but especially in areas where they can't afford some of the, the technological adaptations or the, the harder engineering approaches, um, to integrate ecosystems and those services into, um, um, into urban en environments, particularly with respect to climate change. So the other point I wanted to make with respect um, to thinking about designing systems that incorporate um, ecosystem, functioning ecosystems is that it's good to think about how this system is functioning overall. So uh, kind of looking, we want to design it for a suite of services, but we also need to think about any um, costs or disservices that it might accrue. 
And so just to give you an example, there are lots of people working on different ways, environmental accounting methods. So you may have heard of life cycle analysis, kind of as a subset of that. You can calculate uh, a, a piece of infrastructure or, or design's carbon footprint, which is looking at how much carbon it's emitting over its lifetime. Um, the energy footprint would be very similar to that. You could have a water footprint, so looking at how much water um, a, a particular process or, um, or management system might require. Let's see, there's also there's plenty of other disservices. So you can look at pollutants that are released by um, engineered systems. You can look at, we saw the example with the, the ponds and the wetlands looking at if you're creating habitat for disease vectors. So some of these things that you might call a, um, a cost to human health and well-being in some way. And then there's also some other methods um, that kind of get away from that, but that such as energy that are accounting for all of um, the solar energy that goes into a system to make a particular product. So I'm just going to show you briefly um, an example looking at a carbon footprint as a way of assessing different types of urban green infrastructure. So green infrastructure in an urban area, again, relates back to that um, managing the runoff and the water that's um, coming from the surface of our um, urban environments. And so putting it in a pipe is one way but we're trying more and more to use this green infrastructure, right? So preserving wetland corridors or, or putting in rain gardens and wetlands and some of these other systems that um, keep more of the, the ecosystem services intact. And so we looked at a series of different approaches that would give you or that would allow you to do that. And so we, we saw ponds and wetlands earlier. You have bioretention, which is like a rain garden, so it's kind of a depression that's vegetated that water can flow into and then it seeps into the grounds. Um, you could have a cistern, so you might be capturing rainwater from a hard surface and then using it, you could use it to irrigate your lawn or um, for some other purpose, you know, people, you know, you can collect that water and flush toilets, all sorts of good things. Um, some sort of filtration device, you could have Permeable pavement, which isn't really green, but some people throw it in there because you basically, rather than just having a hard surface that water runs off of, you can infiltrate some water. Um, and then green roofs, which are becoming really popular because you basically put some vegetation on the roof, and so you're creating all of these um, services in terms of habitat and regulating water quality and quantity. And so these systems all have positive aspects that relate to some sort of service, um, hydrologic regulation being a major one. But if you look at them in terms of, say, a carbon footprint, so this is the um, energy or related to the energy that's expended in um, the materials that are used to construct these systems, the, the trucks and equipment that are used to con actually construct them, um, and then some of even what goes into their later maintenance, you can see that these systems don't all pan out so well. Um, so for, say, a green roof where you have lots of um, very energy intensive materials that go into those like ex expanded shale and some of these things that are more typical, you can have a huge carbon footprint. Whereas with a wetland or a pond where you're basically just kind of digging a hole and then maybe planting some plants and, and leaving it alone, you have a much lower carbon footprint. And so this is an important component I think in terms of thinking about designing um, for ecosystem services is that we need to consider kind of a broader range um, of the life cycle of these different systems. And so I'm getting close to the end here. And so these are just kind of some of my thoughts is as we move forward or as maybe you consider how you might fit into this picture um, of how systems could be designed or otherwise managed um, to provide ecosystem services, is that there's still a lot of questions. Like we need, we need to better understand, for instance, how social cultural factors constrain or enable the policies that are um, pertaining to ecosystem services. Um, we don't really understand, again, the interactions and trade-offs between different ecosystem services and, and how those might look in a, um, an engineered type of or design type of setting. Um, we currently, for the most part, don't really integrate um, ecosystem services or those are kept very separate from our more traditional economic markets. So are there ways to start um, building in incentives that um, provide some 
financial or, or other sort of benefits um, to land or resource managers to help encourage um, protection and, and enhancement of ecosystem services. Um, and again, how can we use these to better inform policies and decisions? How can we look at um, use and exploit synergies between techno ecosystems? So kind of, I didn't talk about this earlier, but um, an example of this, he, here in Kansas even, the city of Wichita has a very um, impressive system, I guess, who you say, um, because they're, so basically, their ecosystem that they rely on to provide water, they don't, they're running out of water. So to kind of get around that, they actually draw water from a surface feature, from a river, and inject it into their groundwater to try to keep a store that they can have as well as managing a few different other water quality problems with that. But one of the issues is that there's a lot of sediment in that water, so they have to remove the sediment before they can inject it into their groundwater. And so thinking about, you can think of this as a synergy, this is creating a perfect opportunity and incentive for the city of Wichita and for landowners upstream to try to use some natural-based methods to keep the sediment out of the river, basically. So whether that's through stream restoration and improving the functionality of, this, of the stream ecosystem or looking up on the agro ecosystems and better controlling um, the sediment losses from those systems, there's some, some real potential to start integrating, not, as opposed to fighting, right? So, so integrating our technology with um, ecosystem service management. And then looking at how these services are, are distributed and how we, can, um, how we can manage those better. And so these questions involve a whole lot of different disciplines, a whole lot of different interests and expertises. And then of course, we don't wanna not include the public as well because right, everyone's benefiting from ecosystem services. We all need them for our health and well-being. And so with this slide, I just wanna make the point that it's, um, one, ecosystem services are, are for everyone, but two, that there's a lot of tough questions that remain to be answered, but that are going to require a lot of collaboration and discussion among these different groups of people. I, I specifically put the sociologists and the engineers talking or asking questions <laughs> together, so that was, everyone else is random. But. Okay, so I'm going to end back where we started. And that is with kind of some takeaway points. First, again, to recognize and, and appreciate the immense contribution of ecosystem services to our health and well-being. Whether or not you want to think about this in a monetary form or just appreciating the fact that you eat and breathe and um, recreate and all of those good things, um, that those are benefits derived from ecosystems. And I hope that you could communicate these um, to other people or just um, having this, again, this understanding of that direct connection between ecosystem services and our well-being. And then, again, as you're given opportunities or, or are faced with um, different problems and challenges, I mean, our generation has some huge challenges, right, in terms of how are we going to um, manage with things like climate change? How are we going to feed our, the population, provide enough water for the population? These are decisions that are could take different solutions, and it's gonna be um, a combination of technological adaptations, but hopefully ecosystem services are not left out because we've seen, I hope through this, that, um, that that's expensive and probably not sustainable or, or, or um, resilient. And so with that, if you have any questions, that's all, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was, I'm glad you were at that point. Um, so I, I was giving you an example of how a lot of residential or other urban developments have progressed because they don't want water standing around, which isn't necessarily, in my opinion, that's not good or the way to go. But yeah, so often we fill in wetlands or fill in floodplains so that we can, can build on them. and The water goes somewhere else then. Okay, so did you mean that you would kind of fill in those depressions with soil or something and then build houses on it? Yeah, the oh, houses yeah. Would flood if you you're houses right. In well, and the problem is, is that, for instance, in that neighborhood, and I mean, there's places here in Manhattan too, you know, where we've gone and done that, the water still has to go somewhere. So at some point, 
you fill in everywhere, it's still going to go to the lowest point. And if you happen to build <laughs> your house on that lowest point, so they still have, they have some tremendous flooding issues. And now it's very difficult to get around them because they have gone that route of, of taking away the natural capacity of that landscape to hold the water by building a house on it and okay. filling in. Yeah, so I'm sorry if I confused anyone else on that. So yeah, if you, yeah, we try, it's good to not do that. It's good to, to not fill in. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So, Tricia, you, know, you mentioned in your presentation that more and more the, just the term ecosystem goods and services is, is more well known than it used to be. But was there kind of a, a watershed moment where we, where we started thinking that way? Uh, was there a key publication or a key time period in the past where we made that transition to? considering those important factors about the services. Yeah, I, well, the, the term was coined in the 70s, and so there was a smaller group of people th thinking about ecosystem services. But I, I really think that, that um, Robert Costanza's first paper in 1997, if it, it really spurred um, both interest and then controversy, putting a monetary value on these services that nature was providing. And so I think that's kind of when more and more people started thinking of it, um, not just ecosystem services in general, but seeing it as a kind of a decision-making and policy-making tool in terms of being able to better quantify those benefits or, or bringing that to the public's attention. So. Other questions for Dr. Moore? Yes. Uh, do you know how um, uh, some of the charts you showed like quantify the benefits of restoring ecosystems? Mm -hmm. I don't know how like, they did that or like what resources. Sure. So, and and that was, I guess I should probably be re, re, um, repeating the questions for the the audio. But so the question was how some of the figures in those charts were derived in terms of was it the monetary values that you were yeah. specifically interested in? Yeah. So there's. Um, this is kind of, there's ecological econom economists, and they have all of these different ways of putting values on numbers, or that doesn't, <laughs> the values on the service. And so, so there's, I'm not exactly sure um, how all of those values were derived, um, but for instance, some of the very common ways, like you could see with the, the instance in, say, the Catskill Mountains, they would say that that eco, they would use this um, method that's called um, avoided costs. The cost they avoided was putting in that filtration plant, which was, we'll say, $7 billion. So then they said that ecosystem service was worth $7 billion. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. And there's some other, like sometimes for recreation, they'll say how much are people willing to, how far are they willing to drive to go to a site to recreate? And so that's related back to a cost, and so that's related to how much that service is valued by people. Because it's, it's, and I guess I didn't mention that, or, um, but ecosystem services are very human-centric. It's completely, how do we benefit from this service? And so when we think about monetizing them, it's, it's completely how we, how we benefit, which is a little, and so that's why some of the controversy with some of those papers has arisen, is that people don't agree on how, how to do those methods. But, um, but if you're really interested, I would suggest reading or taking a look at either one of the Costanza papers, because he kind of goes more into how they get some of those figures, as well as in point, highlight some of the controversy as well. Yeah. Well, let's all thank Dr. Moore for his presentation.